Open your Bibles. We are going to be back in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 15. For those of you who've been following along, we are making our way through the series in the life of David. And last week was a big time. Last week was the time when David was confronted with his sin. He had sinned with uh, adultery with Bathsheba and then killed her husband Uriah. And Nathan the prophet came to him and said, you are the man. You are the guy that God has found out about. And we found out last week there were some consequences to David. He was forgiven. And yet on the other hand, there were some consequences that continued on in his life. One of the consequences was that David was told that the sword would be over his family. David had many sons, and chaos really is what ensued with his sons as a result of this whole thing. Uh, one of the things that's an example of this that happened since the last chapter and where we are today is one of his sons named Amnon actually made a thing to, to, to get together with his sister, and he ended up raping his sister. David kind of looked the other way on that, had a very passive response. And so one of his older sons named Absalom was incensed over this and killed his brother Amnon in vengeance. And as a result of that, David banished uh, Absalom from the royal throne, the royal family. He pushed him out. I'm here to tell you the royals in England have nothing upon David and his clan, all right? I mean, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, they couldn't make up stuff like what's happened here in the story. And so again, it's, it's gripping stuff. Today we are gonna drill down on all of this chaos. And I wanna start off with something that still exists in Jerusalem to this day. I have a picture of myself in front of what's called Absalom's Monument. This is a spot in Jerusalem that exists still today. And by the way, most visitors to Jerusalem never find this because it's down in the valley, it's kind of hidden away. And if you make your way to that, which I always, the trips that I've taken, I've always taken people to the spot, and we study the story that we're about ready to read today. If you pass by this monument, if you're Jewish, you take a pebble and you throw it at the monument in shame to Absalom for all of the chaos that he created. And so today, this monument is still here as a testimony to this story and to what Absalom does to try to get his way to the top. Uh, by the way, I'm noticing again that our screen is very green today. You're noticing that too. We found out this week that the projector is going out. The ECA is trying to replace that. So bear with us as we have a little bit of green uh, that's going to continue into our slides for, again, the coming weeks. All right, today we're going to learn that Absalom tries to get to the top the wrong way. He is ready to make his way to the top, but he's going to attempt it with some very devious methods. He has a master class in how to try to get ahead without considering others. He's got ambition, that's for sure, but it's just wrongly placed ambition. And so today, Absalom is going to teach us again the wrong way to get to the top. I'm reading in 2 Samuel chapter 15, starting in verse 1, and this is the way that it is written. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom uh, used this to rise early. Well, I'm going to read a little bit about it. There we go. All right, here we go. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is from such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were judge in the land, then every man with a dispute or a cause might come to me, uh, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take, him, take hold of him and kiss him. Then Absalom did to all of Israel uh, who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel, and at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow, which I vowed to the Lord in Hebron. 
For your servant vowed a vow, which I lived at at Geshur in Aram, saying, if the Lord will indeed bring uh, me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron, but Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. With Absalom, with Absalom, 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, and they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifice, he sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, Gilo, and the conspiracy grew strong, and the people of Absalom kept increasing. By the way, thank you for that light. I'm appreciating that. And a, a, and a messenger to David came saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. And David said to uh, all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee or else there will be no escape from us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out and all his household after him, and the king left ten concubines to keep the house. Today is a story about selfish ambition. And selfish ambition is the opposite of serving others. Absalom didn't care how he got control of the throne. He would use any amount of energy and he would use any amount of trickery necessary in order to overcome his dad and get the throne. Today I want to talk about five things that were deceiving and conniving that Absalom did in an effort to get to the top. I'm going to reveal these to us with the hope that we learn and again, we learn ways not to do it because those are oftentimes as instrumental in the Bible to us as ways that we should do it. And so for all of us, again, that are trying to move ahead, Absalom is an instruction to us about how not to go about that. So I have five things that Absalom did that were conniving and deceiving. The first thing that he did on his way to the top that was wrong was he went through image. The story begins with him going and buying for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men that would run alongside of him. Why did he do that? Because he was building a certain kind of image. He wrongly believed that if you, need, if you wanted to be the part, you needed to look the part. And so again, he went and did this in order to make himself built up and to look good. The equivalent of this today might be, if you just think out loud with me for a minute, it might be that you go buy yourself a limousine or you buy yourself a black SUV and you have a little entourage of guys that have little earpieces in to make them look like they're secret service. And, you know, you drive around like that and people begin to think you're somebody really important because you look like you're important. Here's the problem with the chariot specifically. Specifically, the chariot was the way that other nations toted their kings around. And God said, that's not the way you, Israel, I want you to get around. I don't want kings to build up a lot of horses. I don't want them to have chariots like this because that's not the way I've proposed this for my kings. Wrongly, uh, Absalom believed that, again, substance was more important, the image was more important than substance. And that's why he went about this, because he wanted to look the part. I want you to hear this. David and Saul never toted themselves around in a chariot. So he was the first one to ever do that. In this way, he's a groundbreaker. He's a trendsetter. And in all the wrong ways, he wrongly, again, believes that image is more important than substance. I want to remind you, Jesus never went around in flashy clothes. Jesus never went around with a crowd of important people necessarily clamoring around him. People came to him for sure, but that's not what he built. Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a lowly little donkey. So that's not the way that our model, Jesus, is going about this. Substance is always more important than image, and Jesus reminds us of that. There is a professor in England who specializes in political communication. His name is Darren Lilker, and this is what he says. Human culture is a visual culture. From cave paintings to selfies, 
you, we always have used images to tell stories about our lives, about our experiences, and about our understanding of the world. But the idea that the picture never lies is powerful but untrue. For pictures do not always tell the whole story. And the fact that images can be strategically constructed, manipulated, or chosen carefully to convey an impression can often go unnoticed by people who are looking at them. Here's what I want you to hear. In the political realm, image is very important. And handlers are always making sure that pictures are taken or video is taken in exactly the right light to show uh, their their their, their politicians or their leaders in a certain light. And so those are always being manufactured for you to view them. And so Absalom is not the first leader to ever use the power of a symbol to sell his brand. I want to give you a reminder of how this works and you're always being you know, promoted or you're always being, things are being pushed at you to give individuals in a certain light. Maybe it's safe to us Asked for us to use some politicians outside of our own country. And so I have here Boris Johnson. And here he is uh, standing in front of a group to give a speech. And I want you to notice here that he is surrounded by uh, police officers, I think from probably London. That's where he's probably giving this speech. And what that's conveying without even hearing any part of the speech is, all the police are with me. They, they, they are, they're my advocates. They're standing at attention around me. And so this is what this visual image is trying to, again, tell us. Maybe I've got one that's a little bit more fun than that because this is Vladimir Putin. <laughs> and Vladimir Putin, I am not joking about this stuff. Vladimir Putin had a series of shirtless photos that were put out by his press department. And they were trying to tell us something, I guess trying to tell the world something, I guess they're trying to tell us that for an old guy, he's still got some shape, uh, a little brown shape in some ways, but you know, that's okay. Uh, they're also trying to tell us he's this rugged outdoorsman because they had a fishing picture, they had a hunting picture, they had a, whor- a picture of him riding on a horse, and somebody mentioned this morning that there's some memes of him riding on a bear and uh, him holding a cougar or a puma, and, I mean, so there's all kinds of memes that have been fun with this as a result of this. But they're trying to sell us something about Vladimir Putin. And I'm here to tell you that's always what's happening with people that are important people, people that are politicians. They're always selling us a brand. And Absalom is no different. My mother always told me what's on the inside is more important than what's on the outside. And that's a reminder for all of us. If you don't have good things going on on the inside, what's on the outside will make little difference. It might fool some people, but it's going to make little difference. And that's the first mistake that Absalom made is he counted on image more than he counted on substance. All right. The second wrong way to the top is through trash talk. Trash talk is disparaging or insulting speech that is about another person. And so how did Absalom accomplish this? Well, The first thing Absalom did was he went every morning. It says he got up early every morning and he went to the city gate. Now, I want you to think in your head, he went to city hall because the city gate was the passage into the city where people went to have legal matters heard by the king. And so he positioned himself just a little bit before city hall and everybody came by and they said, he said, where are you from? Where, tell me where you're from. Oh, we're from this and such part of, the, the, of Israel. Oh, we're so glad you're here. What's the issue that you have today? And so he would always fawn over people and he would tell them, oh, yours is such you know, a really good case here. And he would say, you know, I just wish there was somebody in the land of Israel that was acting as judge because right now the king doesn't have anybody here for you. And so he was trash talking and he was throwing dad under the bus And making himself out to be this heroic figure in Israel that everybody should should now trust as the one to adjudicate all of their cases. Trash talking is usually an attempt to make others look bad and for us to look good. And so we are making somebody else, we're disparaging somebody else or putting somebody else down with the hopes that it will make us look like we're virtuous people. Now by trash talk, I'm not talking about playing pool with your friend. That's not what I mean. What I do mean is, again, that you're disparaging somebody for the hope that you get some sort of gain out of it and that you're spreading false 
information about them, usually that they don't know about. And so you're disparaging them behind their back. There's a favorite story I have. I've, I've actually spoken about this before, but it's been a lot of years ago, so you may or may not remember. But Robinson Cano was a second base all-star that was traded from the Yankees to the Mariners back in 2013. When that trade happened, Cano went back to New York for his first game that he was going to play as a non-Yankee, a Mariner, and he knew that he was going to face some boos from the crowd at, at Yankee Stadium. And so as only can happen with Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Fallon welcomed Cano onto his show and he did, said to, to Cano, let's do something special together on your way back into the city. And so they made a cutout of Robinson Cano and they took it around the city. Here's that cutout. There were people that were encouraged to go to the cutout and to act like what they wanted to do with Cano when he came into Yankee Stadium. So what are you going to say to Robinson Cano as, when he comes back? How are you going to boo him? What they didn't realize is that Robinson Cano stood behind the cutout. And he was going to make his way out to the people as they were interacting. So they almost all started the same way. Get with you, Cano. You're not welcome anymore. Go back to the Mariners. You know, go back to Seattle. And so they had this big rant going on. They said one guy began uh, shaking his hand and jeering, and all in one breath he said, boo, you suck. And, and then mid-sentence he said, hey, welcome back to New York. <laughs> so it's one way when you see the person you know, in the flesh, and it's another way when you think you're saying something that they can't hear. And Absalom made it his specialty to trash talk dad Dad wasn't around. I can trash talk dad and I can steal the hearts of these people who think that he's not doing his job and I'm doing it for him. Trash talking or putting other people down is never a way to the top. <laughs> and a good thing for all of us is to always ask ourselves if what I'm going to say about my friend, if I, if I can say that, if they were standing right here, would that be safe to say? And if you can't say that, it's probably better not to offer that little opinion that you have at that moment. And so again, that's a good reminder to us. That's not a way to the top. The third wrong way to the top is through flattery. Uh, notice two things that Absalom does here. First of all, he claims that all of the claims that you have are good and just. And so again, everybody that comes and has something that they want the king to hear, he says, Oh, that's like the best case I've ever heard. Now, I want you to test this. If you've ever been around a court, is every case a great one? I don't think so. There are people that bring frivolous cases to the courts all the time, and they have twisted up motives all the time. And so again, there's a good pr a proportion of people that don't have great cases, but that's not what came out of Absalom's mouth. Absalom's mouth came out, this is the best case, I, case I've ever heard of all in an attempt to flatter and bring those individuals along with him. There's one other thing that he did in this passage that I think is very instrumental, and that is that people came up to bow before him and give him homage. Now again, think England here for a minute for us. If you meet the king or the queen, you bow. And this was the ancient world. This is the way it worked. If there was a dignitary like this, they bowed. They came up to Absalom, who was trying to look the part. Remember, he had the, the entourage, and he had the chariot, and so they're ready to play their part. But then he reaches up to him, and he says, oh, no, 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 no. And he grabs him by the hand. He comes forward, embraces them, and hugs them, and kisses him. Oh, I'm just a man like you. I, I'm the law and justice candidate for the little man. And so that's the way he wanted to come off, is that he was just the one that was going to look out for them, but the whole time it was just a show. He, he, he had no idea of really of the way he was going to support any of these individuals. He didn't really care for them. He just wanted to play the part. Flattery makes others feel good, but it doesn't promote what is right. Again, I have another example for us here, and it's from a favorite Christmas movie, The Christmas Story. And you remember Ralphie wants the Red Rider BB gun. That's what he really wants above all other things for Christmas. And so he's trying to work every angle he can to get the Red Rider BB gun. 
and he gets a, a, an idea in his head. The teacher has promoted that she wants everybody to have a creative writing assignment and to write what it is you want for Christmas. And so Ralphie thinks, this is my opportunity. I'm going to write in the paper that I want the Red Rider BB gun, and then I'm going to do something special for the teacher. And so this is a picture of him going to the teacher, and what he brings to her is an enormous fruit basket. You can't really see it, but on the table are these little snow globes and oranges and these little gifts that kids brought to the teacher. And he brings this enormous gift to her with the hope that she will be complicit in saying it's a great idea to get the Red Rider BB gun. Now, if you remember the story, he looks at the bottom of the paper a few days later as she tests, uh, finishes the exam and, and gives the scores. And at the bottom, it says C plus... And she writes there, you'll shoot your eye out. And, 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 and you know, his mother keeps saying that. So he hates that, is the fact that uh, now the teacher's in with his mom in that way. The way to the top is never again through flattery. Merely telling people what they want to hear is not the formula for your success or for theirs. And Absalom, again, gives a master class on how to go about doing flattery for your own ends. The fourth wrong way to the top is through what I'm calling power moves. And Absalom tells his father, you know, I've got to go back to Hebron in order to fulfill a vow. And he says, I made a vow to God that if he would bring me back to Jerusalem, then I would make an offering to him. So dad, I'm getting ready to go to Hebron and I'm going to make an offering there. His dad goes, hey, sounds like a good, op- you know, good, good thing to do. Who am I to hold you back from fulfilling a vow to God? Go to Hebron. Why did he want to go to Hebron? It wasn't for making an offering. It was to go to Hebron in order to declare himself king in that city, 20 miles away. It would be very difficult to declare himself king right there in Jerusalem. Dad's here, but I can go 20 miles away and I can make this whole thing work. And so he went and he sent messengers out throughout the countryside to say, when you hear the trumpets blast, then that's the point at which Absalom is king of Hebron. And he chose Hebron for another reason too. It's because that's the first place where dad was ever uh, coronated as king. And so it's got a kind of a kingly feel to it. And so he chooses that city very wisely. There's something else that he does that I think is actually brilliant, if not sinister. And what he does is he says, I made a tabulation of 200 of the most important men in Jerusalem and I invited them to Hebron. Come to Hebron. Have something good to eat. Vacation with me. And all of them make their way to Hebron. And they are, do not suspect, are not suspect about what he's going to do at all. They don't know he's going to declare himself to be the king. And so here they are as his guests. And they're essentially captive guests. As he announces himself king. And what he's done in that one fell swoop is, that one power move, is he's deprived dad of those 200 men that he would have probably been counseling with as this whole disaster occurs. And furthermore, it now appears that these 200 men have defected to Absalom. And so dad is thinking, I think I just lost 200 really important people. And so dad doesn't know. Remember, this is the day before any text messages. It's the day before any emails. And so there's no way to communicate that way. And David is just left saying, I think 200 guys have just left me. And I, you know, I don't really want to make of this, but I think you know, I'm on the down and outs right now as a, as a result of that. Power moves are Absalom's specialty. And he is willing to claw his way and make his way to the top at, at whatever way he can. All right, there's one more thing I want you to see here. There's one final wrong way to the top that Absalom pursues, and it's through what I'm going to call bruised alliances. He makes friends, the scriptures say, with Ahithophel, and that name might sound familiar from, to you from two weeks ago, because Ahithophel is one of the key advisors of David. And so he's managing to pull across, think in your minds, Supreme Court justice. If you're getting ready to do a coup, you want to have somebody that looks like they're in authority and are the individuals of the law that are next to you. And so he brings Ahithophel over, and as he makes this announcement, he has this Supreme Court justice that's next to him. Now, why is that important? Well, Ahithophel is the one, uh, an important guy. He holds that position as an advisor. But the other interesting thing is, and why this name might sound a little familiar to you, is that Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. 
And so Ahithophel knows that David has committed adultery with Bathsheba and he's no David fan. And so he is the guy saying, I'm going to do this just to spite David. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link myself up with Absalom because we both dislike David and that's what we can join together on. There's an old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And what is going on here is, is that both of them have the same enemy, Ahithophel and Absalom, and so they can join together as being enemies against David. There's something that happened a week ago that I want to bring to your attention because it didn't get much TV coverage, didn't get much press on the news, but there was a, a union that happened or a reestablishment of diplomatic relations between the countries of Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I have a picture of it here because it was brokered by China. And so again, think of my enemy of my, is my, uh, the enemy of my, my enemy is my friend. You've got two arch enemies here. The Saudis do not like the Iranians. Why? Because the house of Islam, Muslims, are split in two between Sunnis and Shia. And the Iranians represent the Shia branch of Islam. And the Sunnis represent the, excuse me, the, the, the Iranians are the Shia. And the Saudis are the Sunni branch that has Mecca. And both of those don't like each other. And there's been disputes that have been going on for years. But somehow... China brokers the deal in the midst of that. And why? Well, because all of them have cold relationships with the United States. That's what can bring them together. Now, again, that's a fragile way to build a partnership because history says that may not last. But nevertheless, that was brought together and is a modern-day example of, again, the enemy of, of my enemy is my friend. It's probably not an ongoing relationship that's going to be very good because it's so fragile at its foundation, and it was with Absalom also. All right, let's turn to the rest of the story. Uh, we've seen how Absalom is ready to claw his way to the top, but what's going on with David in the midst of all of this? Well, in verse 13, it says that David has a messenger who comes to him and says, you know, uh, Absalom has just declared himself king in Hebron. And by the way, it looks like all of Israel is with him. And so David plays really the only card that he can. And he starts an exit of all of his family and his important advisors out of Jerusalem. And so they pack all up and it's with great mourning that they make their way out of Jerusalem, up the Mount of Olives and out on their way to escape so that they aren't overtaken and killed by Absalom. And so again, that's what's going on in this chapter. What's also going on in this chapter is, and, and, and maybe your ears perked up, because I ended my reading with one sentence. David left 10 concubines in Jerusalem. And you're like, hmm, uh, what was that all about? Why, do, why did he leave those concubines there? And I want you to remember, last week, there is a, a demand or, excuse me, a uh, uh, an edict that God gives to David and he says, David, what you've done in silent, what you've done in the dark, I'm going to shout from the rooftops. When you slept with Bathsheba, you thought it was all secret, but I saw it. And when your penalty for this comes, it's going to be in broad daylight and the successor to you is going to sleep with your wives in open public. And so these concubines are left behind and in the next chapter, Absalom comes and he has relations with those women on top of the, the, the porch so that everybody can see it. And he says, now I'm the king. I've got the power and I've got all the rights as a king. If you know the rest of this story, uh, he does overthrow David for a period of time, but it doesn't last. His, his, his uh, revolt ultimately gets turned over by David and it's interesting the way that Absalom dies. It's kind, of, it's kind of comic, actually. Absalom goes out to battle, and he's riding along on his horse, and his big mop of hair gets stuck in the limbs of a tree. And you can imagine the horse keeps going, and here he is, whoop, he's just suspended in midair, and there's nothing he can do to get his hair out of this. And Joab, the commander of David, finds him and tosses three spears into him and kills him. And David is heartbroken over this because it's yet another son that's gone. But this is the end of Absalom. But here's what I really want you to hear today. Absalom is the outgrowth of David's disregard for God. I mean, we learned that last week. 
that David deserves this. David earned this from, from his actions. And really, Absalom is just an outgrowth of what has happened in David's own heart. God spared David, forgave David, but there were still repercussions for his life. Back to the meat of this story today. Absalom demonstrates the wrong way to the top. The top can never be more important uh, than, uh, and uh, more self-centered to us and th- that we would have calloused relationships with those that are around us. In God's eyes, this kind of ambition breaks justice, it breaks community, it brings disaster upon people and indeed upon the one that goes about this. And of course, Jesus is our ultimate uh, and highest example of how not to do this because Jesus perfectly listens to the Father and is obedient to all that he hears the Father say. And so his relationship with the Father matches his listening with the Father. Selfish ambition never prospers, but humble obedience does. Using the story of Absalom as our reminder, uh, ambition detached from God is always deadly. Ambition that's detached from God is always going to be deadly. And so the encouragement of this passage is to wait upon the Lord. It's to wait upon the Lord for our ultimate success. He even defines our success and then empowers our success. And that's what this passage is really all about, is waiting upon God. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you and thank you again for the power of your word and you give us examples of how to live and how not to live. And today is one of those examples in which you're saying, beware of this. Beware of the sin of Absalom. And this is why people still to this day throw rocks at Absalom's monument because they're saying that's not the way uh, it's best to live life. That's a life of shame. Lord, protect us from that. If there's any vestiges of these five ambitions that are in our lives, would you purge those from us so that's not our true north. Our true north is you. And we would be like David waiting to get to the throne at your hand and at your uh, granting of it. And so, Lord, uh, we have much to learn, and we pray that you would do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.